Good morning. If you were paying attention during our gospel story today, and you were here last week, you might have almost wondered if we kept the same story in there for two weeks in a row, because it's very, very similar. Last week was the story about doubting Thomas, where Thomas doubts that Jesus is truly risen, and then Jesus shows up and shows Thomas the wounds in his hands and his side to prove that he is, in fact, risen. And this week, Jesus shows up to the whole disciples and does basically the same thing. He says, I'm not a ghost. Look, I'm real. See, touch, feel my hands and feet. Now, it's, it, this is actually probably backwards, I think, because Thomas supposedly wasn't there at the first time when Jesus introduced himself to the disciples, and that's why he didn't believe that Jesus was risen. So I think we got these two backwards. But I think last week, India did an excellent job talking about how Jesus meets us where we are. This isn't this demand of, of uh, believing without seeing, like we have to trust all the time with no evidence, that that's not what faith is really about. And as I listened to her sermon... I was uh, reminded of a podcast I heard a couple years ago. It included a theologian named Marcus Borg, who actually taught for years at Oregon State University. And what he was talking about, he's an expert in Christian language. And he was talking about how our ideas, our understandings of faith and belief, have really transformed over the years since Jesus' day. That it used to be this very robust tradition and it's largely in the modern day become boiled down to thinking the right thing, right? Like belief or to have faith means to think the thing is true. But he says that it used to be more broad than that. It used to be, yeah, you, you thought the thing, but also the thing came from within you. It affected your life. You lived through that faith and belief, and that was part of having it. And it, belief and faith also encountered or it included a super amount of trust in God for the things that you didn't know because that was okay too and that was also part of belief. Which I think is really cool. I think that's really good news for us as individuals. And then I got to thinking, I wonder what it's like if we look at belief and faith that way through a communal lens, through a church type of lens. I had a podcast that aired last Friday. Yeah, shameless plug, you're gonna get a lot of those. <laughs> It was a podcast that came out last Friday featuring uh, Chase Isaacson as my guest. He's back there in the, the booth running our cameras. <laughs> Keep on me, Chase. <laughs> but in, in the podcast, he told me this story about, he's been here his whole life, and he was telling me about when he was young, when he was little, just running around the old church halls and getting into trouble and messing with people, and he could describe it in great detail. In fact, it, it went on for a little bit. Only a portion of it made it into the episode. But I had such a good time listening to him talking about running around this church as a kid. And it reminded me of my time growing up in a small-town church in Ontario, Oregon. Because I was a pastor's kid, so I was always at the church. In fact, at first I was a youth pastor's kid, um, so I was always hanging around, running in the gymnasium of the church or in the youth room, bothering the teens, playing on their foosball tables and their video games and things that were set up in there. I remember that during worship, when I was little, I was in the side aisle, and I would have the, my little toy race cars, and I'd be on the floor playing race cars up and down the side aisle, quietly, but I was <laughs> playing race cars, um, and no one ever seemed to care too much about it. And I remember one summer when I was probably in, in maybe, not quite middle school, still in elementary school, when my mom had to work. She also worked at the church at this time, and uh, I didn't have daycare. So during the days for an entire summer, I was just at the church. I just ran around. I projected video games up on the big projector screen in the youth room, and we built forts in some of the classrooms and things like that. It was just, the church was my castle. I loved church. It was like a second home to me. But it wasn't just the space. It wasn't just the building of the church that was like this. It was also the people. I talk about messing around in the youth room all the time. And the youth, when my parents were youth pastors, were such great impacts on me when I was a kid. I remember one kid, he was a teen at the time. His name was Matt. He taught me in the youth room how to save my progress on the Toy Story video game. <laughs> because it was just too much for me to try to defeat the Emperor Zerg in one sitting. I couldn't do it. I needed to come back and try again. And, and I had tried for weeks. I had to start over every time. And he finally taught me how to save. 
And I remember that several of those same youth were my babysitters that would come over to my house and they would babysit me. We would play with my Hot Wheels and make giant tracks or we'd go in the basement and make giant blanket forts, all sorts of things like that. And we'd play all my favorite games. And I remember one year specifically there was a Super Bowl and all the teens came over to my house for a Super Bowl party. And during the halftime show, we went outside, and I was probably like six, and we were just in the street, under the, the street lights, tossing a football during halftime. And I thought it was the coolest thing. There was even one student whose name was Michael, and he became really close with me, kind of like a brother during this time. He went off to college, and his college was about an hour away. One day, he came back, picked me up, and he took me for a night in his dorm room. I was like six. Can you imagine that? How many like 18, 19 year old college kids do you know that wants to pick up a sixth grader that's not their sibling and just take him for a dorm room visit, right? I mean, that was so, so cool to me. And I had like three, four, five different sets of church grandparents as well at this church. Um, I remember, first I remember Grandpa Norm and Grandma Gail. Um, they were like my favorite babysitters because I, I remember, you know, when I was young, it was still kind of scary to get put to bed. When you turn the lights off and your mom and dad aren't home, it's kind of scary. But I have some specific memories of Grandpa Norm and Grandma Gail putting me to bed and always feeling safe. Um, and not to mention, uh, Grandpa Norm only had one hand, which was the coolest thing to a six-year-old. <laughs> I thought that was very, very cool. Uh, and then there was Robert and Karen Douglas, the Douglas family. When my siblings were born, I was over at their house. Uh, it was at their house when my parents came in with my sister Audrey for the first time, and I had been so excited to see her. Um, I, I look up over the, the edge of the baby carrier, and I see this tiny thing, which wasn't what I expected, and I said, when can she play? <laughs> 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 but the Douglas family, they, they were the place we went, that, and I associate that with that time. I'd go over to their house, stay overnight when my mom was in the hospital giving birth, and they had a daughter named T, who was another one of my favorite babysitters. And then they had a son named Wade, who was six foot four and played on the high school basketball team. And he was basically God to me. <laughs> and every once in a while, he'd take me out back and we'd shoot hoops. And then there was Jim and Kathy. And I would go over to their house to stay for longer periods of time when my parents needed a trip off to themselves or if there was business or something like that. I remember at their house, I learned about record players and how that worked. And they had a box of cars and toys and things in the closet that came out for their grandkids, and they came out for me too. And I remember one time when I was there for four to five days, uh, Jim one day calls me over and says, hey, Kyler, come here, brings me into the garage, and he digs out some old golf clubs, takes them over to a saw, and he cuts them in half. <laughs> and he puts the grips back on them and gave me my first little set of golf clubs to take out for a round with him. I know. <laughs> it was so, so cool. I know it sounds like I'm just like splattering a bunch of different mini stories out at you, but I'm doing it on purpose because I want to paint for you this mosaic of emotion, of, of what it meant to me to grow up in that kind of community. And it was great as a kid. It felt so good. And then as I grew up, this community ended up coming through for me in bigger and bigger ways. Fast forward just a few years, the day before my 13th birthday, so this would be March 14th, uh, 2009. I come home from school, probably from basketball practice. I've got my backpack in my hand. I walk in the front door. Um, my dad's watching TV, Sports Center's on, and every day after school I would do this. I'd sit down on the couch, pop my backpack next to me, and watch Sports Center with him. But this day I sit down, set my backpack next to me, and my dad just goes, go put your stuff away, which not like my dad at all. Didn't think about it for a second. I got up, grabbed my bag, and went straight to my room to put my stuff away. And when I opened my bedroom door, Matt was there, the one who helped me save the Toy Story video game. He was in there, and there was a drum set in my room. Yeah, and it was his drum set that he got and that he learned to play drums on, and he was giving it to me for a birthday present. And as <laughs> we sat down, and for the next like hour and a half, he gave me my first ever drum lesson. And while I was in that drum lesson, my parents got a phone call. And they got called, they said they needed to come into the hospital. My sister Brenna had been, she was seven at the time, um, had been really sick for a while. And we figured there was some sort of virus or something that we couldn't kick. But while I was in this drum lesson, my parents got a phone call to come into the doctor's office. 
And that's where they learned that Brenna had leukemia. I'm so glad I was with Matt <laughs> drumming. My parents came home. They got home minutes after Matt had left from the end of the drum lesson, and they told us the news. And I was the only one of my siblings that was old enough to know what leukemia was. And I went into my room, and I drummed until my fingers bled. And I did that so many times while Brenna was going through cancer. Which, by the way, I'll take a pause in the story to let you off the hook. Brenna is 23 years old now, and goes to Boise State University, and has been cancer-free for like 12, 15 years, something like that. So it's, it's excellent. But Matt being there with me in that moment was huge. And as we went through cancer as a family, there were so many nights when my parents had to be at the hospital or something would go on, and people from the church would come over. They would stay the night, they would you know, cook us a meal, they would drive us to where we had to go. And then, within a year, something else happened. My mom started to just get really sick very suddenly. Um, two or, th I think it was three times, she actually went septic out of the blue um, and landed in the hospital inches from losing her life. It, and it happened multiple times, where, and we didn't know what was causing it. She, she went to the Mayo Clinic to figure it out. It was this whole story. Never really actually sorted out what it was, but it stopped happening eventually. But I'll never forget the second time it happened, I was at a choir rehearsal, and my parents had dropped me off at choir rehearsal. <laughs> and just a couple hours later, someone from church picks me up, says, hey, your mom's in the hospital again. You're going to come stay with me. I'm so glad that I had the safety that I already felt with my church community in that moment, because that was scary. And this, like I said, this happened again. And church people continued to come through for us time and time again, cooking us meals, driving kids where we needed to go, babysitting for us, taking us into their own home. When my parents couldn't make one of my sports games, people from church came to the game, so I had someone I knew in the stands. I loved this church community. It was so, so impactful for my life. And I attribute a lot of this to being in a small town church, right? I mean, a lot of us, I, how, by a raise of hand, how many of us are from small towns? Okay, that's some of us. That's some of us. I bet some of us here probably have been at St. Andrew long enough to remember when Beaverton was a small town too, right? I know we've got some Midwest folks and whatnot. Small town churches are just kind of different. They, they do things a little bit differently, and if you've been to one, you know what I mean. But I think St. Andrew, I don't think we're necessarily a small town church. I think we're a little bit more of like a city church, or maybe it's a suburban church. Now, that has some advantages to it. I mean, we have resources available to us. We have things we can go do. There are community organizations we can partner with, Emerge, The Immigrant Story, MACG, things like that that are available when we're in areas like this. We can go march in a pride parade. We can go protest and be heard. There are lots of things that being a city church allows us to do. There's also, though, some disadvantages, I think. Because sometimes the busyness of life in and around the city can mean that church life, like everything else, becomes compartmentalized, right? It becomes something that we do between certain hours because that's what we have time for, or it becomes a place that we show up to and then we leave from, or it becomes a community that we show up to and we leave from. I think there are things that we can learn in that regard from small town churches. One of the easiest things we can do is we can keep getting to know each other better. And later on in my podcast with Chase, uh, we got to talking about uh, a variety of things, but one of them was our tendency that most of us kind of have a not assigned seats, but generally places in the, in the sanctuary here that we like to sit. Um, I'm guilty of it as anybody else. And, and I know we sit in our spots for good reasons. You know, Amy is a front row person. <laughs> She's got front row energy. Farrakh loves to be over by the music. She, he loves that. And I need to be by these windows because I love to look out at the trees during the songs or during the sermons and reflect. We do it for good reasons. Um, and it's not inherently bad. But it does and can mean that sometimes we tend to interact mostly with the same group of people and not everybody, right? Um, we, can, we can be right side people or left side people, and we know other left side people and right side people or center people. You're not forgotten. The, the moderates of St. Andrew, we appreciate you. 
<laughs> and, but we don't necessarily meet everyone from all around. I remember in my podcast with Terry Moe, we talked about the, the state of St. Andrew relationally, and he said, there's some pockets of strong face-to-face -face relationships, but not throughout the whole church. It's not throughout the whole thing. In fact, I, I thought today, and you can thank me later for not doing this, I thought about before the sermon just having people get up and switch spots, go sit somewhere else. <laughs> I won't make you do that, but you can think right now just how uncomfortable you would have been and how many of you would have protested that ask. <laughs> it's just kind of part of who we are, and that's okay. We can be front row people or right side people or whatever, but I think we can learn a lesson from small town churches and not letting those pockets develop, going out of our way to make the crisscross kind of connections. Another thing that I think small town churches do really well is they have time, or at least they act like they do. Right? You ever been in a conversation at a small town church, or better yet, a small town grocery store? <laughs> no one's in a rush. No one's in a hurry to get out of there. Even if they have something to go to next, being there with you, having that conversation is the most important thing in the world. They like to have those genuine one-to-one -one conversations where they ask questions. They like to go out to lunch with each other after worship is over. Um, and they have time even, to th or they make time at least, to think about one another during the week. Who needs a phone call or a visit? Who might need a meal? I wonder if the youth pastor has enough volunteers for Earth Camp this summer. Yeah. All sorts of things. <laughs> Shameless plugs. Hey, I don't get the platform often enough. I've got to use it. <laughs> they have time, and they make time to think about things, because sometimes we get stuck in the city and we're just going too fast, and a lesson we can learn is just slow down. Time to talk to one another, time to connect with one another, time to think about one another. And I think today, since we're welcoming some new members, officially becoming part of St. Andrew, we have the perfect time to practice. So I hope that you look at faces as we welcome new members later in this worship service and that you make a point to go up and introduce yourself and get to meet them. Ask them what their favorite color is, for example. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you'd go try and sit in a different section of the pews sometimes. I don't know, maybe I will, I'll think about it. <laughs> maybe you do. And if you're an introvert, sorry. I know, like this is hard, but, but we do want to meet you too. You're important. Your relationship with us is important, too. So to wrap up today, I'll just start us off. Welcome. Whether it's your first time visiting us, or if you're becoming a new member, or if you've been a member for your whole life, or if you're not officially a member yet, but you're here anyway, welcome to our community. A community that exists not because we all think the same things about God, or the universe, or politics, but because we believe something divine happens when we all do life together. To those of you that I know, and to those of you that I look forward to meeting sometime soon, welcome. It is so good to be here with you.